And what is going on guys? Okay, so Halloween is just around the corner. So in this video, <laughs> we'll be making this guy. Also, I would like to let you know that I will be making and selling a few of these. So check the description for more info. And back to the video. So most of you don't know this, but I'm actually a huge uh, Halloween and dark ride enthusiast. As a kid, my room was essentially transformed into an all year round Halloween haunt. I was even going to make a how-to video about one of my props. Hi everyone, welcome to my first Fun for Fan how-to video. But uh, yeah, that never saw the light of day. My passion for Halloween animatronics is what got me into mechanical engineering. I haven't really made a Halloween prop in a while though, so I thought it would be nice to dive back into the wondrous world of monster making. So let's dive right into it. First step, as always, is design. This is the basic mechanism I came up with. This pneumatic cylinder simply pushes against these bars. This pushes the skeleton up. This second bar forces the skeleton to stay somewhat vertical. I say somewhat vertical because you may have noticed that the bottom bar is slightly shorter than the top bar and they are not perfectly parallel to each other. This was done so that the skeleton leans forward at the last second and sort of hovers above you. This is a 3D representation of a spring. This acts as a counterweight to help lift up the skeleton and remove some of the load off the cylinder. These are shock absorption springs. I didn't represent these on the 3D model. Every pivot point was done using M8 bearing blocks. These remove play and make the entire system smooth, silent and efficient. And let's get building! Cue the DIY montage! Okay, so that probably would have been cool enough as it was, but I wanted to go the extra mile and animate the arms and head using smaller pneumatic cylinders. This is the mechanism for that, very straightforward. Let's talk about pneumatic cylinders for a sec. In very basic terms, the way these work is compressed air pushes a piston back and forth. If compressed air is forced through the bottom orifice, the piston comes out, and if air is forced through the top orifice, the piston goes back in. These valves are used to reduce airflow, giving you control over the piston's speed. For this particular prop, I purchased Festo adjustable cushioning cylinders. These have shock absorbers built into them so that the piston slows down near the end of its travel. You can see that in slow motion right here. This makes the animatronic a lot smoother and significantly improves its lifespan. This is a single head 5 to 2 way solenoid valve. These use an electrical current to switch the compressed air from one tube to the other and to vent the exhaust. This means that in this tubing configuration, when 24 volts is applied to the valve, the piston comes out, and when 24 volts are removed, the piston goes back in.
Here's the main cylinder. This one's by Festo and has a 300 millimeter stroke, which is plenty. Now let's get painting. This is my super fancy high-tech painting booth. After cleaning all the parts and rubbing alcohol, I sprayed on a layer of primer. This helps the paint stick to the metal. Then I could spray on a few layers of black matte paint. The paint helps protect the metal against corrosion, and in this case, helps hide the mechanism to sell the effect. And here is the painted and reassembled mechanism ready to go. Of course, every good haunted house prop needs a good scary character. I purchased an anatomical skeleton for medical training purposes for about 100 bucks. These are really nice because of course they are anatomically correct and very realistic. However, they are quite heavy and expensive. Of course, the biggest issue here is that they are way too white and squeaky clean. Not very scary at all, so I'll need to rough it up a bit. So the nice thing with pneumatic cylinders is that because the air inside them is compressible, they naturally offer great suspension and shock absorption. Okay, let's get painting. This is dark brown pigment for paint, plaster and whatnot, and this is basic black acrylic. The trick is to mix these together and to dilute them in plenty of water. After spraying down the model with primer, the mix can simply be brushed on, letting the mixture drip down as this will give it a nice aging effect. So that's pretty cool, but I want my character to glow under black light like this. A black light emits light in the near ultraviolet spectrum. They can only emit UVA wavelengths, so they are completely safe to look at. The cool thing with black lights is that normal colors and objects don't get illuminated by them but objects in paints containing fluorescent and phosphorescent pigments react to the UV and illuminate, creating that awesome radioactive glow we all love. To have the skeleton glow under blacklight, we'll be diluting UV red and a tad of UV blue in some water. This can then be brushed onto the skeleton while the brown is still wet. This will allow for the UV paint to partially mix in with the brown, and this just creates a really nice texture. Next, some black is used to create some contrast. And finally, what good Halloween prop is complete without blood? I mixed together regular bright red acrylic paint with a tad of blue and thinned it in some water. Then I simply brushed it around the mouth area. Now sadly I was unable to get a deep red color under blacklight with UV paint. I could only get a pinkish orangey color at best. That's why I'm using normal acrylic for the blood. And here he is, looking rather creepy. Now for the tombstone. Now, a great way to create a fake stone-like object is to use foam or polystyrene. I started out by cutting two panels roughly in the shape of my tombstone. The issue with polystyrene is that it isn't the strongest of materials. To strengthen the tombstone, I created this steel armature that will be lodged between the two panels. Also, the reason I didn't attach the tombstone directly to the skeleton mechanism is that when the thing kicks off, the armature slightly bends under load. This would result in the tombstone just shaking around which would completely ruin the effect. I designed the tombstone in Inkscape. I made mine simple for the sake of the video, but if you purchase this prop from me, I'll have it custom made for you. I printed out the letters and temporarily glued them on the panel as a guide. Using a Dremel, I carefully carved out the letters. Using essentially a piece of metal, I roughed up the edges to make it look as though it had been, you know, laying around for quite some time. So now let's get painting. I applied a base coat of dark grey acrylic, and now for the magic aging effect. I poured a solution of black acrylic over the tombstone. This solution will just drip down. This immediately increases the creepiness. I repeated this step a few times, making sure I got into all the details and crevices. Next, I painted the inside of the letters with straight black acrylic. This really makes them pop and easy to read. Just like the skeleton, I also wanted the tombstone to glow under black light. I brushed a very diluted solution of UV green onto the tombstone, letting it drip down just like before. 
Using a wet paper towel, I partially wiped off the drips. This will just enhance the aging effect. And the tombstone is done! Next up, sound design. So I really believe the key to a great prop is great sound. I started by recording myself laugh and grunt and scream like a maniac for about two hours. I selected my favorite parts and edited them together in Mixcraft Studio. I duplicated the track and pitch shifted that duplicate. I added compression, reverb and some EQing. After that, I slapped on a few thunderclaps, bone cracks and whispers and ended up with this sound effect. <laughs> <laughs> Great! In order to blast that sound in people's face, I went with an EV ZLX 12BT. These have an integrated 1000 watt amplifier and a 12 inch woofer, yet this thing will really get the ground shaking when that thunderclap hits. Next up, lighting. I purchased two fun generation RGB UV LED projectors. These can be controlled by DMX, I'll get back to that in just a second. Of course, by mixing red, green, and blue, you can project any color, including white, which is great for creating a strobe light effect. These also do black light, which means that color, strobe, and black light are packed into one unit, which makes things a lot more convenient. The prop is triggered thanks to this photoelectric sensor. These basically emit a beam of infrared light. The beam needs to be reflected back to the sensor thanks to this mirror. If that beam is disrupted by an opaque object, such as an unexpected visitor, it will essentially tell the controller to start the scare scene. I mounted them on two simple supports to make installation easy. So I could have used a motion sensor, but these photoelectric sensors are a lot more precise. The beam can be up to 4 meters long. Of course, to control the solenoid valves, sound and lighting, I need to make some sort of controller. The brain of the controller is this Arduino Nano, and this is the main controller PCB I designed. I created the schematic, laid out the components, and traced the leads using Easy EDA, and had the PCBs created and assembled through JLC PCB's SMT service. These may look fancy, but they're actually very straightforward. I have a contact, sensor, and three independent push button inputs, and uh, these are just pull up resistors. Then I have six independent power outputs. Now you see, the issue with these microcontrollers is that the output power these things can kick out isn't nearly enough to drive these solenoid valves. This is what these MOSFETs are for. To make things really simple, when a voltage is applied to the gate of the MOSFET, huge amounts of current can be flowed through the drain to the collector. I could then hook up a solenoid, a lamp, a motor, or anything that requires current to function. I could have used relays, but MOSFETs can handle much higher switching frequencies, are silent, and take up much less space. These push buttons simply bypass the microcontroller for testing purposes. The sound is played through this serial MP3 player. These can decode MP3 and WAV files from this micro SD card and play them through this mini jack connector in stereo at 48kHz sample rate. The great thing with these is that there is absolutely no audible loss in sound quality, which is essential for something like this. <laughs> to control the DMX lighting, I purchased this DMX 512 module, but I unfortunately didn't receive it in time for the filming of this video, so I improvised my own using this LTC485 chip and a few resistors. This communicates with the microcontroller via the TX pin. Finally, I modeled and 3D printed this electrical panel. This will hold up the extension sockets, the solenoid valves, and the PCBs. This is then screwed onto the armature out of sight. The cylinders are hooked up to 4mm airline tubing and neatly zip tied making sure that the tubing is not rubbing against anything. Now for the code! So I'm absolutely useless at coding, so I needed a ton of help for this, but in the end got it working flawlessly. The idea is that a series of instructions are entered here which creates a sequence. These sequences are assigned to a scene and a DMX or IO output. We have an ambient scene which loops a 30 minute long thunderstorm sound effect while the lights flash from time to time. We have a test scene that simply activates the arms and head so I can adjust the flow regulators and cushion dampeners. 
And of course, we have a scare scene. I created three different laugh sound effects. The controller will alternate between the three to prevent the sound from being too repetitive. The strobe's flash frequency and intensity are randomized to make the lighting effect look as realistic as possible. We used the DMX serial library for the DMX lighting and the MDYX5300 for the sound. And for now, that's basically it. And here is the finished product. I set him up indoors because of course the lights, the amp and the electronics are not for outdoor use. The amp is hidden in the corner, cranked up at maximum volume. So the prop does need to be either bolted to the ground or weighed down. Here I'm using two car batteries. In order to function, all it needs is a supply of compressed air and a 100 to 230 volt power outlet. And I busted out the old fog machine to enhance the effect. Alright, let's give this thing a whirl. Enjoy the show. And there you have it. So like I said at the beginning of the video, I will be making and selling a few of these. So check the description for more info. And as always, thank you very much for watching and I shall see you guys next time. Uh, yep, yeah, and that's it. Okay, bye.